Today I'm going to talk about sustainable energy, the kind of energy that is safe, clean, and will last as long as the sun does. So how have we been getting energy so far? The answer is by combustion. <laughs> what is a combustion reaction? A combustion reaction is a reduction, an oxidation reaction, or redox reaction for short. In a re redox reaction, the few molecules lose electrons and get oxidized, while the oxygen molecules take those electrons and get reduced. So the key to a combustion reaction is the electron transfer from the few molecules to the oxygen molecules. So what are the few we've been using? For a long, long time, it has been biomass, such as trees. And for the past 100 years, it has been coal, oil, and gas. When we burn fossil fuels, it produces carbon dioxide. You may have heard natural gas is much cleaner to burn than coal oil. And the reason is natural gas has more hydrogen items than coal and oil. So coal has zero, oil has two, and natural gas has four. So from that perspective, the next clean fuel of choice would be pure hydrogen. Because combustion of pure hydrogen is going to produce only water. But if we are going to use pure hydrogen as the fuel, there is a much better process, much better alternative than combustion, which is a fuel cell process. So in a fuel cell process, we insert a membrane into the redox reaction process. And we still have the hydrogen oxidation, we still have the oxygen reduction, but now they are spatially separated by the membrane. And we're now forcing the electrons to go to the external circuit to do some work for us, uh, such as powering our homes or our cars. Fuel cell process is intrinsically much more efficient than the combustion process. It could be 60% versus 20%. So now the question is, why don't we have fuel cells in our homes and in our cars? The answer is fuel cells requires platinum as the catalyst, and platinum is very expensive. So one of the goals of my research has been to eliminate platinum from fuel cells. Now let me tell you how by first sharing with you some of the major milestones in the development of fuel cell technology. 1839, fuel cell principles were discovered. The original experiment is not exactly the same as the one shown here, but it's quite close. So imagine you have a beaker, you have sulfuric acid in it as the electrolyte, and you have two platinum wires in the sulfuric acid. You bubble hydrogen on one side, and you bubble oxygen on the other side, and you measure the voltage across the wires, and you got a voltage. And that's how fuel cell principles were discovered. <coughs> About 100 years later, it was realized once you switch from sulfuric acid to potassium hydroxide, you no longer need platinum to be the catalyst. You could use a much cheaper metal, such as nickel, to be the catalyst. So now the question is, why don't we work on potassium hydroxide fuel cells as much as we do for proton membrane fuel cells? Well, the answer is, we never really wanted to deal with sulfuric acid, or potassium hydroxide. These are the liquids. They are very corrosive. 
if you use your fingers to touch them, it's going to burn your fingers. And we really wanted to have a piece of a plastic to serve as the electrolyte in the place of sulfur acid or potassium hydroxide, because it's more convenient for us to deal with. And that is why when DuPont, a Delaware company, invented the polymer called Napheon in the early 60s. And that really set the foundation for the proton membrane fuel cells. But it was recognized in the past several years, as long as you stay with an acidic medium or electrolyte, you're going to need platinum, whether it's a sulfuric acid or a proton conducting membrane. So the question we asked several years ago was, can we come up with a Napheon equivalent? It's going to be a polymer membrane, but this time it's not going to conduct proton, it's only going to conduct uh, hydroxide. By doing so, our hope is we can have a solid electrolyte, which is convenient to deal with, but also be able to use a non-precious metal to be the catalyst so we can make affordable fuel cells. And this is what we invented, quaternary phosphonium hydroxide membranes. So how does it look once we make the switch from a proton membrane to a hydroxide membrane? As you can see here, it actually looks almost the same as the proton membrane fuel cell. How does the hydroxide membrane look? <coughs> this is the chemical structure. It's a polysulfone polymer. It's very cheap, <coughs> readily available. And the chitine is the quaternary phosphonium chitine, which is very conductive for hydroxide. It's also very stable in alkaline environment. And this is how the membrane looks. It's really just a piece of plastic. It's transparent. Once we put this membrane in a fuel cell, we can make a fuel cell shown here inside that gold colored box. And this one doesn't have any precious metals such as platinum. So the most attractive feature of this fuel cell is the price. You can see platinum is selling about $1,600 an ounce right now, and nickel is only 50 cents per ounce. So once we have our fuel cell, the next question is, where are we going to get our hydrogen? Because hydrogen is needed for the fuel cell I'm working on. Of course, we can get hydrogen from fossil fuels, but that's not what we wanted. We wanted to get hydrogen in a way completely free of fossil fuels. And the way we're going to do it is using solar hydrogen. Basically, we're going to take solar energy, split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and the design we have here is a three-layer structure, very similar to a fuel cell. In the middle is a hydroxide membrane. And each side, we're going to have the Earth-abundant catalyst, meaning very inexpensive. And we shine light on it. We're going to produce hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other side. You may have also heard uh, wind electricity and solar electricity is very important for us today. And it's going to get increasingly more important in the future. But in order for these energy sources to be widely used, we have to have a massive, large-scale electricity storage technology. Because both solar and wind are intermittent in nature. The sun is not up there 24 hours a day, and the wind doesn't blow all the time. 
one of the approaches we're taking for saving wind and solar electricity is using flow battery. So what is a flow battery? A flow battery has a structure, also three layers, just like the fuel cell and the solar hydrogen device you saw. In the center, it has this membrane, and on each side of the membrane, you have a redox pair. Illustrated here, you have an example of iron oxide, and uh, what you do is, if you have these redox pairs, they are flipping in coordination. In one way, they can store the charges from solar and wind electricity. When you flip it, you can use this device to provide electricity when you need it. So recently, we came up with a new design. And this is based on hydroxide membranes. And this membrane is going to make the flow batteries much more efficient and much high, will have much higher energy density. So in summary, uh, this is a dream of mine. A dream where we're going to have a solar hydrogen roof on every house. And we're going to have a fuel cell car in every garage. And this is the dream enabled by the hydroxide membrane we invented. And this is the dream, I believe, worth spreading. Thank you.